So by now, we've had an introduction to what knot theory is kind of generally. We spent some time looking at diagrams of knots and figuring out the extent to which the diagram for a knot is an invariant for that knot. And part of that conversation, an important part, was looking at the nature of crossings in a knot diagram. How many crossings are there? Are they overs or unders? How can we reduce or increase the number of crossings without changing the type of knot? Um, and so we want to dig a little deeper into that uh, by focusing in on crossings, kind of the, the local, the zoomed in viewpoint, I guess, of a knot. Um, and for the moment, at least, we're going to not pay attention to the big picture of how a whole knot connects in with itself. So we want to study specifically crossings, and as much as we can say about how crossings interact one with another. We'll do that by studying objects called rational tangles. And a rational tangle, as we had an introduction at the end of the last video, is a set of crossings here in the middle, let's say. And then instead of a knot, which closes in on itself, a tangle is tethered at the four corners of a rectangle. And so by studying these tangles, we can sort of get a sense for not only how do crossings interact one with another, um, but also how does abstract algebra, sort of the algebraic thinking and the questions that we can ask in algebra, fit into the study of knots and crossings. So in this video, we're going to first talk about what are rational tangles. Uh, in particular, we're going to focus on how tangles are built out of two types of operations, twists and rotations. Second, we're going to think about how twists and rotations relate and interact one with another. Um, so how, how, do, how do twists and rotations um, change one another's... Uh, and what we'll get out of that study of interactions is an abstract algebraic object called a group. We're going to call it the tangle group. It's going to be the group of all things that we can do to add more twists or to add rotations to make a tangle more or less complicated. Um, so that's going to give us our first foothold into algebra per se. But the holy grail for us that we're going to get a taste of in this video and we're going to move on to uh, and study more deeply next is in what way can we take a tangle and discover what we hope to be an invariant for that tangle, which is a number, specifically a rational number. And rational numbers are what give rational tangles their name. So at the end of this video, we'll hopefully get a taste of how to assign to a rational tangle a rational number, which is an invariant of that tangle, meaning that it can tell us everything about the nature of this tangle, enough that if somebody gives us a rational number, we should be able to produce the tangle that that number corresponds to in a unique fashion. All right, so first of all, what are rational tangles to begin with? Uh, we start by defining what the empty tangle is. And the empty tangle is nothing but two horizontal parallel strands tethered at these four corners. And rational tangles, by Conway's definition, are anything that we can produce from that empty tangle through a series of two operations, twisting operation and a rotating operation. The way the twist works is we take the top right vertex and we cross it over the bottom right. So if we started from an empty tangle and then performed this twist operation, we would get this tangle. And as you can see, this is essentially the, the simplest uh, way to introduce a crossing into a rational tangle is this, this one uh, top right over bottom right twist. Um, in general, if I start with a tangle, call it G, uh, applying T, the twist, to that tangle is just going to take those two right-hand vertices and cross them over one another. So twisting is just a way to add one more crossing uh, into a rational tangle. Rotation is the other thing, the other operation that we'll be doing on tangles, the basic operation. And it works starting for an empty tangle just by rotating that empty tangle by 90 degrees. What that does is it turns all of my horizontal strands into vertical, and if I have any vertical strands, it'll turn them into horizontal. Um, and for the purposes of rational tangles, we're going to consider these two tangles actually not to be equivalent to one another. Uh, so it will matter for us uh, which, which vertex is connected with which, right? If I'm connecting them across horizontally, connecting them across vertically, I get something that's different. So we want to, we want to maintain that distinction for the purposes of studying tangles. If I'm starting from a general tangle, then this rotation is just going to turn the whole tangle to the right clockwise by 90 degrees. Uh, so these are the two basic operations that will define rational tangles. So an example of a rational tangle that's a little bit more complicated than the ones over here on the right uh, might be this one. So you can imagine how this tangle probably started out, well, must have started out if it is a rational tangle, from the empty tangle. 
Uh, and then it looks like what we probably did is we did a bunch of twists, maybe five of them here. Uh, then we performed a rotation and did several more twists. Then we performed another rotation and did a couple more twists. And then maybe we did some more rotating. And, then, and so that ended up with this, uh, with this rational tangle. Now, not every way of connecting the four vertices with two strands is going to be a rational tangle. Um, that's a question we're going to come back to a little bit later. Um, but this would be an example of one which is. And so our holy grail question for today is how do we find a numerical invariant for rational tangles? What is a way in which I could take a tangle like this one and assign to it a rational number in a way which is invariant, which tells me everything I need to know about how to recreate this tangle and represents it uniquely? So let's talk first about how to find algebra, specifically abstract algebra, uh, within the study of rational tangles. And the way we do that is by looking at that twist operation and that rotation operation and observing that these are not unrelated operations one to another. We can't do arbitrarily many twists and combine them with arbitrarily many rotations in whatever order we want to without jumbling up our results in some ways. Each operation has potentially an effect on the other. And the clearest and most simplest way, I think, to see that that's the case is to study the difference between uh, the application of a rotation followed by a twist, so if I write down RT, I'm going to read that left to right as rotation followed by twist, compared to twist followed by rotation. And if those two give us different operations on tangles, um, then there's a non-commutativity there that indicates that there's something interesting going on about how T's and R's interact with one another. So let's think about RT. If I start from an empty tangle, and then I apply R to rotate that tangle. I'm going to end up with this vertical empty tangle, if you like. And then I'll apply T. And what T does is it rotates around the, the it crosses the right over the left. Um, but what I'll get, an intermediate step I suppose I could have put in here, is I would have gotten this thing with a single twist in it, which we can untwist using a Reitermeister move. Uh, and so when I do R followed by T, I haven't actually created any essential crossings, any intense crossings in this diagram. Uh, and so what I end up with after R and T is just this vertically untangled uh, tangle. Okay, so what's the difference if I did T first and then R instead? So starting from an empty tangle, if I first did T and then did R, that first twist is going to introduce a crossing, and then when I rotate my diagram, that crossing is going to be preserved. So even starting from an empty tangle, the result of doing RT is different from the result of doing T followed by R. So these operations are not commutative. These two tangles are what we call not isotopic to one another. Isotopic, for our purposes, we're going to just define it vaguely right now, means that we can't turn one of these tangles into the other just by smoothly bending some of its strands. Right? Uh, what we would have to do to turn one of these tangles into the other is either cut a strand or uh, trade places with some of the vertices or something. So there, there's nothing we can do just by smoothly bending strands that's going to turn one of these tangles into the other. And so what we can say so far about these tangle operations T and R is that they're not commutative. That if we build an abstract algebraic group on top of these two objects, uh, that group is going to be what we call not an abelian group, uh, which means that it has a chance of having some really interesting intricate structure uh, that we can study more deeply if we want to understand how tangles work. So let's think more deeply then about each of those operations, the twist operation and the rotation operation. Thinking with our abstract algebra hats on, what can we say about those operations in and of themselves? So let's first think about twists. What happens if I take a tangle and I start twisting and twisting and twisting and twisting and just applying T repeatedly? So if I did one twist to this tangle, I'm going to introduce a crossing over here on the right, and that new crossing is going to make this tangle different than the tangle that we started with. Now what happens if I do that again? I'll introduce one more twist over here on the side, and that's going to be different, too, than the one that we just had, etc., etc., etc. So every time I add in one more twist, if I'm just repeatedly twisting, I'm continuing to get new tangles every single time. So what we say in abstract algebra is that the operation T is an operation that has infinite order. Every time I do a twist, I get something which is new, and I'm never going to twist so many times that I've magically somehow untwisted myself back to the identity. Right? So Another way to say that with notation is that if I twist i times and I twist j times and the result that I get is always the same, then that must mean that I twisted the same number of times that i must have been equal to j. Right? Every time I twist, I get something different. So we'll call t in abstract algebraic language uh, a generator for our tangle group that has infinite order. Or more compactly, we'll call it a free generator inside the tangle group. 
So that's for twists. We can twist forever, and we never get back to where we started. What about rotation? If I take this tangle, G, and I rotate it once, if I apply R to it, then we do get a different tangle than the one that we started with. Um, we agreed uh, a couple of slides ago that the orientation horizontal versus vertical for strands will make a difference because it changes how the, the vertices of this uh, square out here are connected one to another. So if I rotate once, I get a tangle which is different. If I then rotate again, then what I'm going to get is I'm going to get the same connections across vertices as I had in the beginning. If I had horizontal connections in the beginning, I'm going to have horizontal connections again. If I had vertical in the beginning, I'm going to have vertical in the end. And all the crossings that make up this tangle in the middle are still going to be the same type of crossings, the same overs, the same unders in the middle. And so it turns out that once I rotate a tangle twice in succession, I end up getting the same tangle that I started with in the beginning that is isotopic, that just by smoothly bending the strands around, I can get the same tangle back that I had in the beginning. And so when I've rotated twice, I get the same tangle back. And so the second power of R, if I rotate twice, gives me the identity operation on tangles. And so using abstract algebra language, we say that R is an operation that has order 2 inside of the tangle group. So already we can see a couple things. That Tangles, uh, the twists and rotations interact one with another. They don't commute. It matters which one we do before which one. And so if I'm stringing a bunch of them together, the order in which I write them matters a great deal. And now we also understand that these two operations are fundamentally different even just in isolation. That the twist has infinite order. We can do it as many times as we like to and we never get back to the identity. Whereas the rotation undoes itself right away after just a single application, or after a second application. Um, so they're fundamentally different operations, and we know that rotations undo themselves. The next question that we're asked, and we're going to pick up on in the next video, is if we know how to undo a rotation, because it's its own inverse, according to this, uh, this language here, that R composed with R itself gives us the identity. Now, how do we undo a twist? So far, we only have one type of twist in our, in our language here. We only have a way to twist the, the upper right uh, over the bottom right. Uh, if we wanted an untwist, we would either need to introduce a new type of twisting that does the, the bottom under the top, or we would need to try to figure out a way to build the inverse of a twist using more twists and possibly rotations. So that's where we're going to go to next, is the question of, we know how to undo a rotation. Can we undo a twist just by using more of the same types of twist, possibly combined with rotations? That's going to give us a real insight into just how intricate the algebra inside of our tangled group can get.